Excellency, uh, Mr. Jashanka, Secretary of Internal Affairs of the Indian, Your Excellency, Sumia Sarai, Vice President of the Observer Research Foundation of the Indian. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me indeed a great pleasure to attend this first Resina Dialogue in the head of the Ministry of the Southern Affairs of India. I'm so happy. I've just come back from a visit to the very cold, well, Canada. And to be in this warm piece of land of the world. I got a sore throat in autumn. And now it's improving now in the day. So I'm really happy. From early days, as a, when I was a, a some 50 years younger, I came to know this great country. And uh, as a diplomat, I have a high respect and a sincere love for all good neighbor, India. Among other things, India recognized New China as early as on April the 1st 1950, when New China was only half a year old, and India then also recognized that there is but one China in this world, and that Taiwan province is part of it. So in China, we are always grateful to the Indian government and to the Indian people. In other things, for instance, in the field of science, and technology. We also have every reason to be grateful to India, an ancient civilization. As long as 50 years ago, my teacher from both China and America told me that it was the India who first invented the numerals or the figures from one to nine, and most importantly, Zero. Suppose it, it, if we did not have the invention, but the Indian people, how could we now enjoy the age of internet? It, quite, it was quite imaginable. So I believe everybody in the world, including all of us here, have a reason, has a reason to respect and love the Indian civilization. So this is a, another reason why I'm so happy to be here again. Now India is an emerging economy and it is making great contribution to the economic growth of the whole region and the whole world. At the moment, as all of us are aware, the Asian, the Asian economy has generally maintained relatively fast growth and contributed over 50% to the global economic growth, playing an important, an important role in promoting prosperity of the whole world. Most Asian countries are now developing, developing ones with large population, big markets, late commerce advantages and broad prospects. However, on the other hand, they are also at a crucial stage, stages of economic transformation and upgrading, facing such challenges as imbalanced domestic development, relatively backward infrastructure, funding shortages, and inadequate resilience against external risks. Well, as an Indian saying goes, which I just learned last night, 
Greatness is made one brick at a time. By the way, let me uh, tell all our friends that I was also terribly happy to learn when I was a secondary school student that bricks were also first invented by the Indian people. Without the Indian people, the invention, the people, well, could not live in such modern um, buildings or the 12 meetings in such a big grid house. For many, for a country to overcome difficulties and challenges, it needs to first find a path suited to its national conditions and manage its own affairs well. At the same time, it needs to, to enhance cooperation with other countries. All continent, Asia, enjoys a vast landmass, abundant resources, huge markets, and a high level of diversity and complementarity. To deepen advanced regional integration will create more and more new impetus for growth. In recent years, Asia has been robust regional, uh, sorry, Asia has seen robust regional cooperation, steadily growing international trade, increasingly active people-to-people -people exchanges, and the, bo and the booming development of a regional community. Countries are sharing the dividends of connectivity and becoming more active to enhance cooperation. Mutually beneficial cooperation and common development have become the consensus of all us Asian countries. Dear colleagues, as a member of the Asian family, my country, China, has taken an active part in the integration process of Asia and the world at large. In 2013, we put forward the initiative of jointly building the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, or the Belt and the Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative and other Asian countries' initiatives have together formed a concerto of Asian regional cooperation, featuring peace, friendship, openness, inclusiveness, mutual learning, and mutual benefit. The principle of joint contribution, wide consultation, and shared benefit and approaches of policy coordination, facilities, connectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration, and people-to-people -people bonds advocated by China have already gained extensive understanding and recognition of many countries in Asia and beyond. The Belt and Road Initiatives do not mean starting something entirely anew. Rather, it is an effort to make full use and to keep improving the existing bilateral and multilateral cooperation mechanism and advance cooperation projects in all fields in a coordinated manner. The Barrett and Road Initiative is not just a concept, rather it is result-oriented. China has made active efforts 
to establish, to establish the Silk Road Fund, an Asian infrastructure investment bank, supporting solid progress of specific cooperation projects with funding. The Barrett and Road Initiative is not exclusive to countries along the road. It is open. It is inclusive and it welcomes participation of all countries and international and regional organizations so that we can all be together to create new opportunities and to share new outcomes or results. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, neighboring countries are China's priority partners for connectivity and external cooperation. China's position as the second largest economy in the world and the medium high growth rate have been made possible by the support, assistance, and help from our neighbors by hearing experience as well as the lessons we want to thank sincerely our neighbors and we will try to enable more neighbors to benefit from China's development achievements and promote one-on-one -on -one cooperation among us all. In recent years, China has been actively working on regional integration by making use of a mechanism like China-Japan ROK, ASEAN Plus 3, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, cooperation with countries in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Central Asia in such fields as energy, economy, trade, and the connect connectivity has yielded significant results already. Last year, trade volume between China and ASEAN already exceeded 470 billion US dollars. And the total number of personal exchanges was more than 18 million. China is also an active participant, participant in South Asian regional cooperation. We have already become an observer of SAARC, SAC, had China South Asia Expo and put forward the in initiative of developing the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar economic corridor. During President Xi Jinping's visit to India in 1914, a series of initiatives were announced for cooperation with South Asia. China and South Asia are connected by the same mountains and the rivers and share similar, similar cultures. We are good friends and close partners, always understanding and helping each other. In recent years, South Asian countries are steadily advancing peace, development, and regional cooperation, while regional integration in South Asia compared with other regions in Asia perhaps is relatively slow, its potential remains huge. Due to geographical constraints and development levels, South Asia needs to improve connectivity both within the region and with the outside world. 
in terms of industrial structures and development strategies, South Asian countries are in a state of faster industrialization. China views South Asian countries as a very important partner, and we stand ready to focus on road transport, infrastructure, manufacturing, and the free trade zones to bring out our respective advantages and promote regional integration, thus contributing to the, to the early advent of an Asian century. As the two greatest developing countries and rapidly growing emerging markets, China and India showed the historical responsibility for driving regional development and promoting common prosperity. I have visited this great and beautiful country, India, more than a dozen times, and I witnessed the rapid pro progress and growth of this country. I keenly feel that our two peoples have the willingness and the ability to take up this mission. China is ready to further enrich the China-India strategic and cooperative friendship and partnership and the work with other Asian countries for connectivity and one one cooperation in the Asian community of shared future. Dear colleagues, dear friends, having said all this, one very touching slogan has suddenly come to my mind. It was used and said many times by New China, the first <coughs> premier and foreign minister, Zhu Wenlai, who visited <coughs> India at least three times. During this visit, he more often than not, together with our Indian friends, said the following phrase. Hindi, Chini, Bai Bai. Hindi, Chini, Bai Bai. Thank you. Maybe my pronunciation is not perfect or not accurate, but I learned that some 40 years ago. Well, dear friends, I've taken note that my young friend, a very good boy from China, Ola Brasta, uh, an extraordinary plenipotentiary to India. Uh, Mr. Le Yutong is uh, also among the audience. I want to take advantage of the etymology of his name to wish this dialogue all good. Well, in ancient Chinese, the counterpart of uh, uh, India's uh, sanctuary Thank you. All uh, the all English, uh, Anglo-Saxon language. His surname Le means good luck or happiness, and his given name Yu Cheng means a piece of a wonderful jade in the hands of skillful workers will become a wonderful piece of art. That is the etymology of his name. So let me wish this dialogue of ours every good luck and every success. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a couple of questions, uh, although we are behind the clock.
uh, there are mics on the side and there are mics uh, to, to in the middle as well. I think Smita had a question already. So we will first go with Smita, find the nearest mic, keep the question short. I want to take two. Mr. Ministers, Hi, Smita Sharma from India today, to your left side. Um, I know you're talking about economic integration, but trust building is important for it. And while China considers Pakistan its all-weather friends, uh, why is it that you also have to support terrorists at the level of the United Nations Security Council? Uh, every time India has tried coming up with proposals to proscribe a Masood Azhar or question Zakir Rahman Lakhvi walking out of jail, China seems to be the roadblock there. Isn't that important for trust building? The question is that Pakistan is your all-weather friend. Yes. But why is it that you also don't support India's plea in the United Nations to define the word terrorism and terrorist organization? Why didn't China support India's case in the United Nations? Young lady, may I know where I am from? And the what is your job? She's from India today, she's a journalist. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always happy to make friends among uh, journalists in the federal press. I really don't know your background, but I know you are an Indian, good lady. And I know, according to the, according to Buddhism, again invented by India, one has to be kind to your neighbors, to, be, to your relatives, and at school, to your friends. This question of yours, I was asked more than perhaps three dozen times. And my answers were relatively the same. That is, as both important countries and developed countries of the continent and the world, we keep our fingers crossed that you would become a great friend of Pakistan. And we hope Pakistan will become the mutual and common friend of both China and <coughs> India and of all the countries in the world. I, I worked in the UN for a few years. Of course, my wife worked in the UN uh, three times more than I. I worked in the UN for three years. She worked UN, in the UN for nine years. So we always carry the charter of the UN with us. So I suggest you will find a good answer to your own question. If you don't have time enough to finish reading this charter, just read the first sentence of the charter. In the first sentence, it has provided for the principles and the purposes of the UN which has just celebrated its 70th birthday. It's raised that the UN purpose is to avoid another war of the world, to avoid the scourge caused to mankind of the two world wars. That is, to work for peace. Peace is the most important. And to work for the people, and to that end, the UN also stands for equality between men and women, equality among all countries, big and small. All these principles, I suppose, if you understand, you will have your own questions answered so well, better than mine, by yourself. <laughs> and also want to I also want to quote China's head of state, President Xi Jinping's words when he addressed the big gathering July, sorry, September the 3rd last year. Towards the end of his speech, he told the whole audience in very three simple sentences. One, Justice is bound to one. Two, peace is bound to one. 
and the three, the people are bound to one. If you have read that, I know you can answer your own question. Thank you. Mr. That was uh, skillfully avoided, but Mr. Muni, please, you can ask a second question. Thank you, Excellency, for, thank you, Excellency, for referring to the Asian century and the role India and China should play. One of the uh, minor or very significant, uh, not minor, very significant area of misunderstanding is Tibet. Now, why don't you, uh, the, the, uh, why is the Chinese leadership so reluctant in talking to the Dalai Lama and resolving your own problem? Once you resolve that problem, I think a lot of things would sort out between India and China. Thank you. The question is that why is China hesitant to have a conversation with the Dalai Lama and uh, make peace with the Tibetan people so that they, there can be better relationship between them? Sir, you are from? <laughs> he's, he's an Good. academic, he's an academic, he's attached to universities and think tanks. I see, you are sort of professor. Professor. At a, for, at a university. I believe a well-educated person, so well-educated or cultured as a professor or a research fellow like you, should understand that for a country, National sovereignty is above everything else and should also know history well. For instance, do you know? You have to know, I believe. <clears throat> as, as, as early as 1237, Tibet already became part of China. And the so, your friend, I hope that is not true. Your friend Dalai Lama is not a head of a country. He is only a political monk trying to divide his own motherland. He used to be a self-owner. You know that? I'm so sorry if a very well educated person should be on his side, should be supporting and justice. I hope our education should be for the purpose to train people, to educate young people, to love peace, to love and stand for justice, not uh, the other way around. Tibet is the part of China, the Dalai Lama used to be a self-owner. And uh, any good person with a conscience should understand this. Thank you. I, I also suggest find some time to read the Buddhist scriptures as well as the Charter of the UN. Thank you.